That is what House Democrats are accusing President Trump of in an article of impeachment introduced today. A vote could happen as soon as Wednesday. Today, Republican Senator Susan Collins said the president did incite the rioters, echoing the exact language in that article of impeachment. She's just the latest Republican to speak out. Lisa Murkowski and Pat Toomey have called for the president's resignation, and Ben Sass has said he'll consider any articles of impeachment sent to the Senate. At the same time, we are learning more about just how dark and sinister things got at, at that siege of the Capitol last week. Video has emerged of the mob chanting, hang Mike Pence, as they pushed forward into the building. And listen to the way House Speaker Nancy Pelosi described what her staff was going through at, as that horrifying afternoon unfolded. Where's the speaker? is something you can be heard in the audio of the events that day. Also coming from the protesters, hang Mike Pence. Those were the words ringing out on Capitol Hill during that insurrection. And this is what President Trump told thousands of supporters just hours earlier. We played that clip for you last week when you heard the president saying, walk up to the Capitol and fight and don't show weakness. The president told supporters, Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And when he didn't, that is, when he didn't violate the Constitution by trying to overturn Joe Biden's win, an angry mob marched to the Capitol and called for Pence, Pence's execution. Incitement of insurrection is a strong charge. But the more we learn, the more appropriate it feels. And joining us now are Ellie Mastel, Justice Correspondent for The Nation, and Sarah Kenzior, a best-selling author and co-host of the podcast Gaslit Nation. Sarah, you have been right for the last five years, basically, about every single thing that has transpired. Um, and you've tweeted that it will be very dangerous if the people who stormed the Capitol and people who incited that riot aren't held accountable. Lay out for us what you mean by accountability. What would that actually look like? I mean, investigations and prosecutions, uh, you know, where merited um, and, you know, arrests and, you know, prolonged hearings on top of that. This was a major event. And the fact that it's been five days and we haven't had impeachment, we've had scattered arrests. We don't fully know what's happened uh, within the Capitol Police. There's been obviously no briefing uh, from the White House. We're in a void of information. And when that happens, it gives the other side, it gives these domestic terrorists the opportunity to write a narrative. And they're backed in that effort, uh, you know, by the state itself. So it's very important for anyone who wants our democracy to uh, endure, um, you know, and for public safety and national security to remain intact, uh, to be on top of this now, um, be fully transparent and also just push for accountability. It feels to me that Sarah's point about it being five days uh, since an insurrection at the Capitol where the entire line of secession was present and the president was the, the person or one of the people who told uh, those rioters to go to the Capitol and fight and not show weakness, uh, that there may be a lacking, I don't know, a, a, a lack of ways in which we can remove the president quickly in this moment, Ellie. What's your reaction to Republicans blocking the measure for calling Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment? That seems to me like, other than re resignation, to be the fastest and safest way to remove the president uh, and, and hold him accountable, like Sarah's saying. Republicans are going to Republican, right? I mean, they are complicit in everything that we've seen. They've been complicit, not just for the past five years, where it's been you know, very obvious what the plan was from these MAGA people. They've been complicit for 30 years. As, as white supremacists have continued to rise and activate and organize to try to change the nature of our pluralistic and diverse society from the ground up. You said that it's been five days since uh, uh, there was an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. First of all, we should probably say it's been five days since the last one, since there's probably going to be another one. And more importantly, these are the same people who are menacing state houses now around the country. These are the same people who threatened to kidnap a, a governor, um, the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. Um, the, these, pe these people are not disorganized. They are annoying. 
They are treasonous. They are problematic, but they're not dumb. They're not disorganized. And we have not done nearly enough to root them out, stem and root from our society. And that that didn't just start with Republicans uh, carrying Trump's water today. That continues with Republicans carrying Trump's water today. It's such an important point about the fact that the, there is organization in, in this uh, situation. Obviously, the early images we saw on Wednesday look sort of ridiculous. You know, you had people dressed up in cosplay, um, you know, like the Punisher, which is just a misappropriation of what that character is, by the way. So dressing up in cosplay to go storm the Capitol, like, this is not a game. Um, but also, there seemed to be a lot of organization and, and certainly more, um, in, in, by the way, of threats towards the line of secession. Um, than we realized at the time initially, Sarah. And some Democrats are concerned another impeachment could consume the Senate uh, during Biden's first 100 days. I feel like that's like besides the point. What happened last week requires accountability and worrying about whether or not it's going to suck up some oxygen during the first 100 days of the Biden administration Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that'll just give them time to go do the vaccine while we're all distracted by holding Trump accountable for the violent insurrection, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is no moving forward without accountability. There's no moving forward without justice. And as Ellie said, this is the culmination of you know decades of abhorrent Republican policies, decades of infiltration of our institutions by bad actors without any kind of accountability at all. We've had elite criminal impunity, and these are just the shock troops. You know, to Trump, his base is disposable. The individuals who stormed the Capitol are just disposable. And so he doesn't care if they die in the process. He doesn't care if ordinary Americans die in the process. He doesn't care if his own vice president dies in the process because he has never been there to serve this country. He has never been there to govern, but to rule and to steal and to make himself immune from prosecution by way of executive privilege and you know wealthier and more powerful. And so that's a key thing to remember here is that you know, even in a typical autocratic setting, usually the autocrat in play wants the state to remain. Here we have the um, the opposite. They want the state to collapse. They want the United States to collapse. That's why he also encourages secessionist movements. So it's critical for Joe Biden to make sure that this country stays together. But a facile, empty message of unity is not how that's going to happen. We need unity against fascism. We need unity against tra transnational organized crime and against corruption in general. We don't need unity with it. So while that message message is important. The only way to get there is a thorough investigation, accountability, and prosecution where merited. Yes, I, I was saying this morning on, on Signal Boost on SiriusXM that you can't have unity without accountability. I mean, how do you, how do you get to unity in uh, trying to unite the country <laughs> um, if you're not holding people accountable for inciting an insurrection? I mean, it's not like you know, any of the things he'd done previously, this seems to be next level, Ellie. Um, the Washington Post is reporting that Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is exploring using an obscure post 9-11 authority to reconvene the Senate and House as reconvene the Senate as the House barrels towards impeach an impeachment vote. Break that down for how this process works. What, what is that post 9-11 authority? Yeah, so Mitch McConnell, who, by the way, was also under threat and was also under attack and also could have been seriously harmed in these attacks, has decided that the way to get out of impeachment is to delay, 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 right? And so right now the Senate is out of session and Mitch McConnell, one of the most powerful senators in the history of the United States of America, is acting like he has no power to bring the Senate back into session before January 19th. That is wrong. That is a lie. Chuck Schumer is using a provision of our post 9-11 laws, which allows the, the Senate minority leader and the Senate majority leader to just the two of us, just the two of them, get together and decide to bring the whole Senate back um, into session due to exigent circumstances, which I think we have. 
So it, there's the authority. Look, if Mitch McConnell wanted to do this, it'd be done. I think that's what we've seen for Mitch McConnell's entire career. What he's trying to do is to avoid having to do the hard thing of forcing his members to take a vote again on whether or not to impeach and remove this president. It's all parliamentary tricks, and Chuck Schumer is calling him on it. It's it's really, and I just want to add, Serena, this what they're doing, what the Republicans are doing is fundamentally the argument of a domestic abuser, all right? Like, we can talk about how all of this kind of starts from a place of domestic violence, but at this point, having had an armed rebellion against our country, the Republican domestic abusers are saying, don't you dare hold them accountable, that'll just piss them off more. And, and, and that is what people who have been in abusive relationships, who have had abusive parents, that is what we've heard so, that's what they've heard so often um, in their lives. And, it's, and, and, and for the Republicans to be making that argument with a, with a plain face is honestly disgusting and must not be accepted by the decent people, by the remaining decent people of this country. Just to take that uh, analogy a little bit further, you know, it is the most dangerous time to leave an abuser, abuser, uh, or the most dangerous time is when you are actually leaving. That is actually um, what all the statistics show. But I think, you know, the Republicans, I mean, if not now, when? If, I mean, he, he tried to incite a riot that resulted in the risk of bodily harm and death to the entire line of secession, including his vice president, including Mitch McConnell, frankly. Um, and so it feels to me like that might be something for a prosecutor to look into. Is, is there even a possibility, Ellie, in your view, that Trump or those who made remarks at that rally uh, could be prosecuted for incitement uh, or Trump potentially prosecuted after he leaves office? There damn well better be. Um, the the stand, there are a couple of standards here. There are lots of statutes um, that 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 speak to incitement of a riot. I think some of the speeches that we saw before the riot would would trip those those statutes. Um, I particularly like 18 U.S.C. Uh, 373, which talks about solicitation of a crime. Um, I believe that's something that the Trump administration, both Trump, Don Jr., uh, Rudy Giuliani, Mo Brooks, I think that's something they all engaged in during that speech. Seth Abramson on Twitter has a really good breakdown of Trump's speech, kind of like minute by minute really showing how the lines were directed to, to make these people act. The Supreme Court test here in terms of Trump's free speech um, is called uh, the Brandenburg test. It comes from a case called Brandenburg v. Ohio. And it basically says that to lose your free speech protections, um, your speech has to be um, basically directly inciting violence, which it did and kind of known that it would do so. And the violence has to happen kind of immediately, right? So one of the big differences between the normal, I guess, formerly normal, because I still have a Twitter account, unlike some people, of uh, Trump kind of tweets about <laughs> this kind of stuff, um, is that the it was so attenuated from the actual violence. But on Wednesday, that dude got up there and stalked for two hours right before they stormed the Capitol. So, so that that is close enough, I believe, to carry a charge for incitement for Trump. And many of the people who spoke at the rally, there, there needs to be actual prosecution of these people after, uh, once they're able to. And one question I would have for every Republican senator who refuses to vote for impeachment, do you still think that the sitting president is beyond being charged with a crime? Because if you think that he's beyond being charged with a crime and can't be impeached and can pardon himself, then all you're saying is that the president is functionally above the law, and that cannot be our system. Absolutely. Ellie Mastal and Sarah Kenzior, thank you so much for breaking all that down. Sarah, you've been right since the beginning, and Ellie, you've been holding us um, to, to the truth and speaking truth to power uh, all four years, so I thank you both for that. Some Democrats in Congress aren't just looking to give President Trump the boot, but as enablers, too. Today, Congresswoman Cori Bush introduced House res resolution to start investigations to remove representatives that went along with the president's failed attempt to overturn the election and incited last week's deadly attack on the Capitol. The Missouri Democrat says they violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which reads in part, no person shall be a senator or representative 
in Congress who has previously taken an oath as a member of Congress shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Coming up, ample warning that this attack was coming. Why wasn't more done to stop it? We'll talk about that when we return in 60 seconds. I just want things to work right for the rest of the day. Is there yeah. no break? Okay. Is there... Yes, hi. Sir, are you at all afraid of taking your oath outside, given no, what happened? I'm not afraid of taking the oath outside, and we've been getting briefed, but I am. Uh, I think it's critically important that there be a real serious focus on holding those folks who engage in sedition and threaten people's lives, to face the public property, cause great damage, President-elect Biden emphasized today that despite the violent attack on the Capitol last week, he is not afraid of taking the oath of office outside when he is inaugurated in nine days. The theme of the inauguration will be America United, and it will be scaled back from prior inaugurations not because of security, but because of the coronavirus pandemic. Security at the event is, of course, a great concern after the storming of the Capitol and in light of new warnings of armed protests in Washington in state capitals across the country. There were also warnings before the riot at the Capitol. We now know that the FBI and the NYPD told Capitol Police about the possibility of violence. But it's still unclear why the FBI, Homeland Security and other agencies didn't do more to protect the Capitol. We have also learned that city officials in D.C. may have been more concerned about extreme conditions by pre extreme actions by President Trump, excuse me, than by his supporters. BuzzFeed reports that officials worried the president might not seize control of the, Jan of the city's police on January 6th as federal officials threatened, threatened to do during Black Lives Matter protests over the summer. That may help explain why the D.C. mayor had not initially wanted National Guard troops to have riot gear or to engage with rioters on January 6th. It will probably take months to unravel everything that went wrong that day. Here to help us are BuzzFeed investigative reporter Roslyn Adams and NBC News national security correspondent Ken DeLady. And Roslyn, I'm going to start with you. Lay out for us the concerns of D.C. officials prior to the January 6th riot. So on Monday, the city council had a had a briefing with um, city leaders, that included the mayor, that included the chief of MPD, it also included um, the DC attorney general, um, and there was a lot of discussion about the event on January sixth. Um, I think that because there had been these stop the steal protests in November and December that had led to violent skirmishes and um, and arrests, um, the council was thinking okay, we know Trump supporters are coming. We know that they're capable of violence. Um, but they thought that they kind of understood the universe of what that meant. You know, they talked, they knew that there were going to be a lot of supporters there because they had gotten um, uh, requests for permits um, for first, what they called First Amendment events. Um, but I mm -hmm. think what the council was really worried about was um, this really volatile president that we've been dealing with for, for four years now. Um, and they were just trying to think about, think through the possibilities of, of anything that could, could really happen. Um, and so back in June, when Trump had um, protesters cleared 
um, from Lafayette Square so he could take a photo op. Um, there was threats that he would take control of the local police around then, and lawmakers were, I think, they were think, trying to just think through every um, possibility. So that was one of the discussions. But, you know, I know that the MPD police chief had told them, like, you know, we've prepared for protests like this before. Their whole force was mobilized. But, yeah, there was a, a sense that, like, Trump, I think, was the biggest wild card on, the, on January 6th. That is such interesting context because it feels to me as though if it were anybody but Trump, like if Louis Farrakhan had stood up in front of a million people and said, hey, march to the Capitol building, fight and don't show weakness, and people charged the Capitol building with the line of secession inside, we wouldn't be confused about what transpired and who was to blame. But because it's President Trump, um, he seems to be that X factor, uh, that element that is making this whole situation very different. Ken, what is your reaction to the breaking news that Congressman T Tim Ryan, who is the chairman of the committee uh, dealing with the Capitol Police, uh, told reporters two Capitol Police officers have been suspended and one of them has been arrested. One of the two took a selfie with the rioters. We've seen that on social media. And the other allegedly put on a MAGA hat and gave some of the rioters directions. What's your reaction to that breaking news? I think it's completely predictable. As soon as we saw those images, I knew that there was going to be accountability for those people, as there will be for these rioters. I mean, it's all on videos, Erlina. They can't escape that. And I think it speaks to a larger issue that we have with law enforcement. Um, there's other investigations going on about whether members of certain uh, uh, police forces were at this um, we're at this event and all across the country, uh, governments are now worried whether any of their people were there. There's, there's, there's an issue here. And I think it explains in part why the uh, security reaction was so muted. Um, they, they did not, as you said, treat it like a Farrakhan rally or like uh, other kinds of events. And it's really interesting to hear that BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed reporting about the mayor's state of mind, because it really seems like the D.C. government was fighting the last war. They were so concerned that Donald Trump was going to federalize the police force and use the military to somehow seize power or do something inappropriate that they kept the military away in an absolute misjudgment. And therefore, the National Guard wasn't armed, wasn't prepared when they needed to be called in. Um, and they also kept, by the way, the Justice Department forces away. And, and, and the D.C. police failed to keep this mob away from the Capitol. And then the Capitol Police obviously failed to defend their facility. But what our NBC News reporting shows is that the FBI had gathered threat information. And they had even visited some extremists who had been planning to travel to Washington, some people they had on their radar who were under investigation, and dissuaded them from getting on planes. And, and one official told us it could have been worse had, had those people gone. But that raises a larger question. OK, FBI, if you knew that there was this danger of violence, why didn't you make sure there was a more robust security posture? Why did you just leave it to the Capitol Police? I mean, the FBI, it's their job to stop domestic terrorist attacks in this, in this country, and that's arguably what this was. And now I think we're seeing, um, and they didn't even put out an intelligence product, by the way, as far as we can tell, which explains why the DC government and the Capitol Police was seemed so ill-prepared, even though they did pass on some threat information. Now we're seeing the opposite reaction. We're seeing FBI bulletins. We're seeing a massive force around the Capitol as we gear up for what could be more violence around the inauguration and other events, Erlina. Ken, do you feel like there's a shift in posture? Because it, it seemed in the beginning people were asking questions about whether or not there was this intelligence. Now we're finding out, based on your reporting, um, there was this intelligence. Those warnings were passed on, but perhaps not in the most robust way possible, and they certainly weren't heeded. So it wasn't an intelligence failure. Is yeah. that the right way to characterize this? Well, I actually think it was an intelligence failure. I, I, I mean, it, there was also a massive okay. public relations failure when, for example, the head of the Washington FBI field office on Friday told my colleague Pete Williams, we had no indication there was anything other than First Amendment protected activity planned. 
That was just patently ridiculous. I mean, we all saw NBC News ran a story before the day before this event talking about all the all the discussions of potential violence on social media. So it, it was it wasn't a secret. But now, Zerlina, we're learning that, you know, in some of these dark web chat rooms that we don't see necessarily, but that people are uncovering, there was some real planning. The people were posting pictures of the weapons they wanted to bring. There was coordination about travel. So that starts to look like that was real intelligence that the FBI either missed or didn't pass on. I think we're, there's a lot more to learn about that in the future. Yeah, this is really concerning. It feels to me a little bit like post 9-11 analysis where all we're learning more and more and more about all of the failures uh, of uh, various agencies. Rosalind, what does it say about the president that officials in the nation's capital fear him more than his extremist supporters. It sounds like the distrust and concern sown by Trump may be one of the reasons, as I mentioned earlier, security went wrong that day. It feels like he's the X factor that is changing people's behavior. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, this is kind of the result of having a president who <laughs> refused to concede. Um, you know, he ha repeatedly said that he has still won the election. And so when you have this gathering of his supporters, like, I don't I don't think it was wrong that the D.C. Count, City Council was trying to predict, well, what if he does this or this? Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, there was just so much going on. They weren't able to prepare for every possibility. Um, but, yeah, you know, we still have nine days left in this administration, which seems like it should be a short time. But um, Trump is a very unpredictable um, figure. And I, I think also the fact that D.C. is is not technically a state, they feel more hampered. Like, obviously, the mayor's um, requested National Guard, but they don't have control of it as a governor would. Um, and then these like laws that allow Trump to possibly take control of their um, of their forces. Um, I think they're also just feel in a more vulnerable position than maybe another state would as well. Absolutely. Rosalind Adams and NBC's Ken Delanian, thank you both for your reporting on this. And we'll have you back as we learn more information, uh, because this story just keeps uh, evolving as we learn more information. Now to some breaking news. The acting secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, has formally stepped down less than a week after the Capitol insurrection and a little more than a week before President-elect Biden's inauguration, a major national security event that seems like Poor timing. Uh, in his resignation letter, Wolf blames his recent depart recent events for his departure. These events and concerns increasingly serve to divert attention and resources away from the important work of the department in this critical time of a transition of power. Coming up, Vogue's faux pas. The disrespectful cover photo of the soon-to-be second most powerful person in the country, why the vice president's team says they were blindsided, and how Vogue is defending their choice. We're back in 90 seconds.
Vogue magazine had the privilege of capturing Vice President-elect Kamala Harris for its February cover. And boy, did they mess it up. The internet was so confused that people initially thought the cover was fake. I don't know what put me off more. The wrinkled pink backdrop that turned a head nod to her sorority into a distracting centerpiece, or the poor lighting that washes out her skin, but still manages to highlight her Converse sneakers. Regardless, it's not a cover worthy of Kamala Harris, the first woman of color elected vice president and soon to be most, second most powerful person in the country. In case you're wondering how she, how she could agree to this, she did it. In fact, according to the LA Times, her team was blindsided by the cover. They thought this image, sidelined for the magazine's digital edition, would, would also be the cover for the physical copy. And they say that's what Vogue agreed to. Vogue has defended the last minute switch, saying the more informal image captured Vice President Alex Harris's authentic and approachable nature. Yeah, no. Informal is one thing. Disrespectfully bad is another. And I'm, a, I'm in the camp of that is a hot ass mess. Excuse me. Joining me now is Alicia Quarles, <laughs> senior news correspondent at Daily, T- Daily Mail TV. I'm sorry. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't hold that in. Alicia, what was your reaction to this cover? When I first saw the pink and green cover, I was like, this is the test shot for the lighting. Like, this is, can't be the real photo. I'm with you. When this leaked online, I thought, oh, somebody just must have put out the wrong photo. But then you find out that this is actually the edition that people are going to get in their homes. This is the collector's edition. It just looks... It looks like I took the Polaroid in my house. I probably look better here right now than that background. It's not of Vogue standards, and they haven't done this before to other, you know, high-ranking. Well, she's the first official um, to be on there, politician in office, but it just it wasn't reflective of Vogue standards. There's so many things wrong with the picture now that I'm looking again at it on the screen. You know, the suit doesn't really fit her the best. The backdrop is wrinkled. The lighting is off. Her skin looks washed out. It's like they didn't have the right lighting, the right makeup artists, the right people. It's like she came in and they're like, let's see if it works. And then they took the test shot and they were, that ended up on the cover. Some people have pointed out that the photos were taken by Tyler Mitchell, who, as you know, was the magazine's first black photographer and has done many successful covers in the past. But he's not the one actually approving cover photos. Were there enough black people in that room when the cover decision was made? And if there was a black person in that room, please show yourself. Show yourself. Come forward. Please explain. Full, full disclosure. Full disclosure. One of my best friends is responsible for the covers at Vogue. I've not been able to talk to him because I do have some questions. What happened? So to your point, Tyler says that he did that um, pink and green background as an homage to her being an AKA. She's wearing a Donald Deal jacket. That's one of her good friends. But it looks like she just walked in and they did a test shoot and then they decided to run this one. And the Michael Kors powder blue suit, um, she agreed to. And the stylist on set was black, Gabriella Johnson, even though Kamala picked her own clothes out. So the, the actual digital cover is beautiful. I don't know what happened here. Yeah, it's really confusing, but I feel like there's something wrong at Vogue. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly through the summer, uh, during the racial reckoning and protests for George Floyd. Um, And, you know, a lot of publications, including uh, Condi, uh, had people resign because of controversy. What does this cover say about Anna Wintour's leadership? Is it uh, sufficient for this moment? Is it right for this moment? It's not right for this moment. This cover shows it, and they do have some explaining to do, and they really didn't do that in the statement that they put out. You know, this is an important time for so many reasons. This woman is the second most powerful person in the nation now, and she should be treated as such and and held in high regard, and this cover just doesn't reflect that. Yeah, it feels to me like, you know, if you have a, a magazine like Vogue, which it really is a fashion Bible. People are getting that hard copy of that magazine. You better get that right when you're talking about the first woman to be the vice president. And Vogue has photographed women tied to the White House before. But as you said, it has always been first ladies. It hasn't been a a politician. Do you think maybe this has something to do with Vogue or maybe fashion publications not necessarily knowing how to portray powerful women as glamorous or feminine? Is Is it a contradiction maybe in their view to have a powerful woman also look feminine and beautiful. 
Well, I don't know, because you just showed those beautiful covers of Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton. And yes, they weren't, Hillary wasn't in office at the time that was taken. But that's a different side of Hillary. She's not, you know, in her, she's usually in her pantsuits, all of that. So there is a way to do this. Look at Kam Kam Kamala was on the cover of Elle. And that was a stunning photo. So there is a way to do it. I, they just dropped the ball here. And this is also coming on the heels of their Simone Biles cover, where people were really upset about the way she was styled, the image they chose. So they got to do better. They got to do better. We got to get lighting and makeup artists and hair people that know how to do black girls. That's what I'm requesting in 2021. Thank Alicia Quarles, thank you very much for being here. Coming up, Trump gets muted on social media. We're talking to Congressman Ro Khanna about the tech industry's swift action after Wednesday's attack on the Capitol. Plus, as President-elect Biden gets his second vaccine dose, we'll find out how his administration plans to improve vaccine distribution across the country. But before we go to break, a reminder to check us out on Twitter. Follow us at Zerlina Show. We're back in 60 seconds. After being banned from every major social media platform, including Pinterest, President Trump is determined to remain relevant for his final nine days in office. Today, he, rewarded, he awarded the Medal of Freedom to Republican Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio. Why, you ask? Well, because he is an inspiration of freedom-loving Americans everywhere. Yeah, right. Today, the Trump administration officially declared Cuba a state sponsor of terrorism, further unraveling Obama-era gains with Cuba and tomorrow, Trump is going to visit a part, part of the border wall in Texas. He's going to Alamo, Texas, a town named after the battle, where a small group of Texans fighting for independence against the Mexican government were defeated after a 13-day siege. We'll let you decide on the symbolism. Wow. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna of California. Congressman, you said yesterday impeachment needs to go to the Senate as early as next week. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer says the House will meet on Wednesday morning to discuss articles of impeachment. I mean, a lot can happen in a couple of days' time. What does that mean for the timeline, especially since inauguration is just nine days away? I feel like we got to get this immediately. It's, it's an emergency. Selena, I agree with you. I thought we should have convened over the weekend, voted for impeachment, gotten it to McConnell's desk. Uh, I'm glad we're finally going to vote on Wednesday. We should send it immediately to McConnell. Uh, put the pressure on him to do the right thing. There are a lot of Republicans who believe that Trump incited violence, uh, having a mob attack the Capitol, even people who agreed with his four years, which I vehemently disagreed with. But those who agreed with his tax cuts, who agreed with American First Policy, they don't support him calling for an attack on the Capitol. So this is the time to impeach him. I imagine their opinions may have changed when they were victims of the <laughs> incite, incitement at the Capitol. If you're a victim of the riot that has been incited by the president, it might have the ability to change your opinion on whether or not impeachment is warranted. Um, but I feel like the timing of this is also tricky, right? You have nine days until inauguration. You have the incoming president, Joe Biden, coming in, and he needs to get his cabinet uh, picks confirmed. Um, how much do you think this impeachment uh, situation that unfolded because the president incited a riot will uh, hamper Biden's ability to, to get those cabinet appointments confirmed and to get his agenda rolling? Well, first of all, really, no, you're absolutely right. If there's one thing that can unify Congress, it's attacking Congress. And so members, uh, Republicans were attacked. I mean, 
the rioters were chanting uh, slurs against Vice President Pence. They were calling for violence against Republican uh, lawmakers. I believe we can do this. The trial is three days. That's what it was under President Clinton. That's what it was under the first impeachment trial. So this is not going to, in my view, hurt Biden's agenda, even if it has to uh, take place in the first few days. A three-day trial is swift. Uh, and then we get to uh, all of the other things. And the parliamentarian is looking at whether we can even uh, move those things simultaneously. Uh, but there has to be accountability. You can't have a president call for attacking uh, their own institutions of government and, and not have a response. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, Silicon Valley is in your district. Uh, and after Twitter and Facebook banned mm -hmm. the president, and as I joked earlier, he's also banned on Pinterest, which is my favorite part, um, their stocks actually slid. Do you think this could be part of the reason they waited so long to ban him? It's not uh, clear that the tweets that they banned him for are more egregious than previous ones. But obviously, this particular week was the one where he incited a riot. Well, I'm sure it's politically easier to ban him now that he's a former president and that now that he's lost uh, political support. But their rationale, uh, even if late, is correct. And that is that there should be no incitement of violence on these platforms. This is not saying you can't have conservative speech. This is not saying that you can't have conspiracy theories, even as free speech. What it's saying is you can't incite violence. So to be consistent, I and my team look up. I said, let's see which other world leaders are actually inciting violence on this platform. It turns out Khomeini, yes, you can argue, uh, arguably has. We're having trouble finding other examples of world leaders that are inciting violence. Anyone who is inciting violence should be banned, but there are not that many who are actually using these platforms to incite violence. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of it that way, right? I mean, you don't see Justin Trudeau tweeting threats at his, par you know, parliament. I, you know, I just, I, I think that we are so far beyond normalcy um, that sometimes it's even hard to see it. Uh, Parler, which is one of the alternative social media platforms that has drawn conservatives and far-right extremists and white nationalists, has also been banned from key platforms like Apple, Google, and Amazon, basically making it impossible to get, almost impossible to get here. Um, do you think that's enough to tamp down on possible insurrectionists um, by just taking away their main platform? I think it's a step. I mean, my guess is that they're going to find another web hosting service. Uh, but again, here, there's a simple principle. When they are hosting speech that is calling for assassination, that's calling for the plotting of violence, uh, that is not protected under the First Amendment. And uh, Apple and Google, as well as Amazon, have repeatedly said to Parler, moderate this speech, take it off, have some enforcement standards. Uh, and I'm glad that they finally held up their uh, terms of service. I think we need legal reform where you can get a court order and require social media companies to remove speech that is a blatant threat or a blatant incitement of violence. I think that would go a long way uh, to helping mitigate some of these uh, plots. And I think, you know, the line is partic particularly clear, especially in these examples. One of the arguments, though, is that... Um, you know, this is a violation of the First Amendment and free speech. Explain why that's really wrong. <laughs> well, they, they should read the First Amendment jurisprudence, Brandenburg, which is one of the most brilliant uh, cases, actually a 9-0 decision. Even the Roberts Court would agree with it. It says, yes, we protect speech, but we don't protect speech when it's incitement of imminent violence. We don't protect speech when it's an incitement of illegal conduct. The hard cases, Erlina, are the conspiracy theories are spreading false information. And there you can say, well, who's an arbiter of truth? But I think it's a pretty simple case that you shouldn't use speech to incite violence against uh, uh, fellow uh, Americans. And so that to me is the easy call. And here you have uh, platforms that are doing that. Yes, and earlier we had Ali Mastal explain essentially the Brandenburg ruling, which held that, you know, um, it, it, the time in between the language and the actual violence matters. You know, we, we saw the president 
tell people to march up to, to the Capitol and fight and not be weak. And then they did that, like almost immediately within hours. And so that is relevant in this particular case. And everybody should keep that in mind um, as they throw out the First Amendment as some sort of catch all. Congressman Ro Khanna, thank you so much for being here and for explaining all of that. These are very important uh, topics that we all need to think through. Today, President-elect Joe Biden got his second dose of the coronavirus vaccine. As states continue to try and roll out the vaccines in a safe and effective way, Biden says he and his team have a plan to get doses out and in use as quickly as possible, especially given the lack of transparency from the Trump administration. My uh, number one priority is getting vaccine in people's arms like we just did today as rapidly as we can and we're working on that program now i put together which i'll be announcing on <coughs> thursday laying out the plan the cost of how i want to proceed the cost of what we have to do to be able to get uh, the, uh, the entire covid uh operation up and running <coughs> three to four thousand people a day dying is just beyond the pale it's, uh, it's, it's just wrong, and we can do a lot to change it. And things are already changing, but not for the better. As we officially have our first case of COVID in Congress after Wednesday's insurrection, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey says she tested positive after sheltering with several colleagues, quote, who refused to wear masks. I am so mad about this. And the attending physician for the Capitol has warned lawmakers they could have been exposed to COVID when they gathered for safety. Joining me now is Dr. Celine Gounder. She's an infectious disease specialist and a member of the Biden-Harris COVID Advisory Board. Uh, doctor, do you think Wednesday's riot is going to end up being a super spreader event? I think we, we know now enough about how this virus spreads. And so when you see those images, you have to wonder. Zerlina, uh, you know, anytime you have a crowd of people indoors uh, wearing, uh, not wearing masks and, and close together, that is going to be a super spreader event in this time. Uh, the fact is the, the chances are you're going to have at least one person in that crowd that has coronavirus infection. Uh, and, and so it's inevitable, frankly, in a situation like that, that you are going to see spread. Just to remind people, would, would you say that it, it's correct to say indoor gatherings without masks are things that we should not be doing? <laughs> Just to, as a general <laughs> rule, that is what doctors are advising against, right? I mean, that seems to be a big statement, but that seems obvious to me at this point. I mean, I feel like we've been repeating this over and over and over again for months. I mean, since the spring. Uh, so... You want to stay away from crowds. You want to, if you're going to be around other people, do it outdoors. If you absolutely have to be indoors, it should be in a well-ventilated place with windows and doors open. You should absolutely be wearing a mask when you're around people who are not in your household bubble. And to the degree possible, you should really be avoiding people who are not in your household bubble. So these are the same things we've been repeating over and over again. You know, whether this was a super spreader event has nothing to do with politics. It's really just it was indoors. It was a crowd. It was people who are not wearing masks. And that is by definition in this moment where you have coronavirus circulating throughout the community. That is a super spreader event. Absolutely. When President-elect Biden got his vaccine, he said he was meeting with your team today. How did that meeting go and what was discussed in terms of what your priorities will be as he takes office? I think it's really important to understand that the president-elect takes the coronavirus pandemic very seriously. He views this as national security threat number one right now. We currently have about 3,000 Americans dying every day on average from coronavirus. That is like having 9-11, uh, the same number of people as died on 9-11 happening every day. And can you imagine you know, having 9-11 hit this country every day and us not doing anything about it, not having a plan months into it. Uh, and so he's very fixated on the goal of getting 100 million doses of vaccine into 100, um, or sorry, 50, 50 million Americans' arms because it's two doses per, per vaccine. Uh, he wants to get those 100 million doses into people's arms over the next 100 days. 
because if he doesn't, you're looking at 3,000 deaths a day, um, and 3,000 deaths by, multiply that by 100 days, that's another 300,000 Americans dying over the next 100 days. That would mean almost doubling the number of deaths we've had so far. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's almost like, it, you know, to use your analogy and keep going, it, it's almost like after 9-11, if George W. Bush had told Rudy Giuliani, like, you're on your own, just figure it out. I mean, just like, you know, fix it yourself. You know, if Congress had just left, dropped the ball and let New York do, do its own thing, that's where we're at with every single state um, doing their vaccine rollout completely differently and on their own. Is the advisory board, as well as the transition team as a whole, being briefed by the Trump administration on where the vaccine rollout stands, or are you guys going to go in on day one and learn new things about really what the real status is of the vaccine distribution, frankly? Well, the, there are members of uh, what are called agency review teams uh, on, on the Biden transition team that are interfacing with their counterparts in the Trump administration, gathering as much data as possible. Uh, it, it hasn't been as complete as we would like, and so there is some information we're simply not going to have access to until um, after inauguration. Uh, so I, I am hopeful that we don't walk into any um, surprises, uh, you know, but we there is additional information that we will be getting at that time. Is this the worst case scenario, in your opinion, when it comes to vaccine distribution, or could things be worse? I mean, I know that there's very few things you can compare to in human history, but it seems to me like this could be going better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think basically there there was no plan for vaccine distribution, uh, and so uh, you know unless you made you know made a point of sabotaging the vaccine supply, it's hard to imagine uh, things being worse. There being fewer plans, there being less funding. Uh, you know, th there are no plans. There is no additional funding to state and local health departments to do this. So it, it's hard to imagine a much worse case scenario that we're walking into. Certainly, it's like no plan or sabotaging the good. Uh, it seems like we're, we're like one step from the worst case scenario. Uh, how does the incoming Biden administration tamp down on outbreaks across the country when it seems at this point the status quo is that every single state has their own separate rules and regulations? Is there going to be a, a, a move towards uh, implementing federal public health guidelines? Well, the president's elect has said many times that he's pleading with Americans, asking Americans to wear masks for the first 100 days he's in office. Uh, he will continue to ask Americans to do that. And it's really important that we do that even after we have been vaccinated. Uh, I myself will be getting my second dose of vaccination tomorrow, and I will still be wearing a mask because we don't yet know that the vaccines prevent transmission. We only know currently that they prevent uh, severe disease and death. And so it's it's really important that we double down on the mask wearing, the social distancing, and all of those mm -hmm. public health recommendations. Absolutely. Dr. Celine Gounder, thank you so much. Uh, and for reminding us that you, if, even if you get vaccinated, you still need your mask. It's very important. If you've been on social media over the last week, you've likely seen this viral video. On first glance, it looks like an officer is just trying to get away from the rioters. But if you look a little closer, it reveals a split-second decision that likely saved many lives. The officer wasn't running away. He was steering the mob away from the Senate chambers while law enforcement officers were rushing to steal, seal its doors. Had the mob made their way into the chamber, they would have met several guards, some with ar armed with semi-automatic weapons, likely leading to an even deadlier day. For his heroism and quick thinking, we say thank you to that brave officer. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlita Maxwell. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on Peacock.
Good evening. I'm Mehdi Hassan. It was one of the most frightening assaults on US territory in the nation's history. It was perpetrated not by a foreign communist army or an ISIS terrorist cell, but by a Midwestern CEO, a retired fighter pilot, a, a West Texas florist, a construction worker, an IT worker, and hundreds more like them. The more time that passes since the Capitol was stormed Wednesday, the more disturbing details we learn about what transpired, how it was planned, and how much more could have gone terribly wrong. Make no mistake, it was bad, but it could have been so much worse. Consider Lonnie Leroy Kaufman from Folkville, Alabama. On Wednesday, as police responded to reports of explosives on the Capitol grounds, they noticed Kaufman's red truck and what appeared to be a gun on the seat. In the truck, according to charging documents, they found a handgun, an automatic rifle, ammunition, and 11 glass jars containing improvised napalm. Yeah, napalm. When they arrested Kaufman, he had two more guns on him. Napalm, remember, was devised by US scientists in World War II to stick like glue and burn like gasoline. A Trump supporter drove 750 miles to the nation's capital with napalm and four loaded firearms. Then there was Eric Munchell, a Tennessee man known as the zip tie guy after he was photographed allegedly storming the capital in full tactical gear with bunches of zip tie handcuffs. Authorities say he traveled from Nashville with his mother and is now in FBI custody. After the assault, his mother told a newspaper reporter, quote, this country was founded on revolution. What do you think the zip ties were for? A day before the uprising, this message was posted to a popular bulletin board for Trump supporters. Quote, the capital is our goal. Everything else is a distraction. Every corrupt member of Congress locked in one room and surrounded by real Americans is an opportunity that will never present itself again. Below that, comments like, mind the exits, storm Congress, and quote, the final solution is the only solution. Black Capitol police officers told BuzzFeed News that they were set up for failure by their bosses and overwhelmed by organized elements in that far-right mob. Quote, that was a heavily trained group of militia terrorists that attacked us, one veteran officer said. They had two-way communicators and earpieces. They had bear spray. They had flashbangs. They were prepared. A far cry from the red-hatted, rowdy crowd who dominated our TV screens last Wednesday. But incredibly, as the siege raged and images of blood on the Capitol steps reached viewers nationwide, the director of the U.S. Army's staff repeatedly denied police for National Guard troops from D.C. And Capitol officials telling them, quote, I don't like the visual of the National Guard standing a police line with the Capitol in the background. Inside the Capitol, some officers and their quick thinking may have prevented the killing or kidnapping of dozens of lawmakers. The HuffPost politics reporter Igor Bobik captured this video that we aired last week of one Capitol police officer retreating with an angry mob in tow. But now we learn that to that officer's less, left, to his left, was an unlocked entrance to the US Senate floor, where senators and staffers were still several minutes away from being evacuated. That officer kept the mob's attention by shoving its leader, by gesturing with his baton, and bravely leading them away from the Senate door. So it was bad, really bad, and it could have been much, much worse. In fact, federal authorities now warn that it still may be. The FBI alerting police around the country today that armed protests are possible at the capitals of every state in the union in the lead up to Joe Biden's inauguration, with one group warning online that there would be a huge uprising if Congress tries to remove Trump via the 25th Amendment. The only problem with that, law enforcement officials point out that Congress can't remove a president via the 25th Amendment. Nobody said the new crop of domestic terrorists was smart, but they are dangerous. And so far, compared to what could have happened, came so close to happening, America has been very, very lucky. Uh, joining me now is Igor Bobic, HuffPost senior politics reporter and the cameraman for that gripping video inside the Capitol as the siege unfolded. Uh, Igor, thanks so much for taking time out to come on the show. We have to talk about this video for, first. Walk us through that. What's happening in it? And when you realize to yourself that police officer may have saved the lives of a bunch of senators and staffers. Yeah, so this this heroic police officer, really, I had no idea how close we came 
to disaster. Uh, at the moment when I had actually recorded it, it was only days later uh, when I realized that the Senate doors themselves were not sealed, um, possibly even seconds before this this police officer ran up uh, these stairs with a with a white mob uh, at his back. Uh, and you could see in the video, he sort of places himself in the door frame and pushes the the lead uh, rioter away from from the most immediate Senate entrance and leads them away to the other side of the chamber where they're, uh, he's got backup behind him coming through and that's where they held them for a good period of time. So really, he may have made the difference uh, between much, much bigger catastrophe really uh, that day. Yes, indeed. Uh, that's what it's looking like now. It's an amazing story, amazing pictures. And here's Congressman Tim Ryan, Democrat from Ohio. You got talking with reporters today about consequences already for Capitol Police. Have a listen. I know that there were two people suspended. One was the selfie uh, officer and another was an officer uh, who uh, had a, put a mega hat on and started uh, directing some uh, people around. Uh, I don't know, if letting them in, letting them out, exactly what it was. Uh, NBC News hasn't confirmed that yet. But Igor, your thoughts on this kind of, on the one hand, you have Capitol Police basically being heroes. One of them, uh, you know, we know about getting killed with a fire extinguisher, sadly. And on the other hand, some Capitol Police officers being accused of complicity. Yeah, I mean, if true, if this guy actually led around and showed showed around the protesters with a MAGA hat on. He, I, in my opinion, he should be fired right away. There shouldn't be an investigation into that if there's footage showing that. Um, on the other hand, as you said, there are a lot of heroic police officers who did their duty and went above and beyond. So I think really there's a lot of questions and the biggest frustration right now, one of, one of the biggest frustrations is that we're not getting answers from the Capitol Police. We're not getting answers from the FBI. Yeah. There's been no briefing from any sort of federal agent yet. We're learning this uh, on the fly from members of Congress who are briefing, on, briefing us on uh, various different things. Uh, it's extremely frustrating uh, days after the attack not to have any sort of comprehensive inform information. Yeah, it's frustrating. It's almost unprecedented. One of the most verbose administrations in history suddenly going all quiet when it's their supporters carrying out the violence. Uh, some of Senator Mitch McConnell's aides told the Washington Post uh, that they dove into one office, barricaded the door with furniture and quietly called anyone they thought might help as Trump supporters rampaged through the hallways. What was it like for you being in the building in that moment? It was terrifying. It was terrifying uh, for me. I, you know, I've covered Capitol Hill for years now, and I've never gone through anything like this. Uh, you know, I, I, and my biggest fear now is that this is only the start. Um, that's my biggest concern. You know, these guys who had stormed the Capitol, they, it wasn't just a couple of hundred of them. They were streaming this out to thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of extremists and fanatics. And uh, now what you're seeing on the Hill is uh, an extreme, extreme show of force. You know, I'm, I'm here now on the, on, uh, at the Capitol and there are hundreds of uh, National Guard troops patrolling the hallways and uh, outside the building. And so I think what you're going to see is uh, preparations for January 20th. And that's that's the next kind of point of concern for us. You're right, that is the next concern. This is not going away anytime soon. Um, Igor, is there a danger here, though? We're talking about just last week and the way these revelations are coming out about the attack, that many Americans will just move on from this. I mean, a lot of people who aren't extremely online, aren't aware of everything we're learning now, aren't following every you know, up and down of the news cycle, like those of us who work in news or watch news endlessly. They don't know about the planning or the nooses or the pipe bombs. They just saw a crowd on Wednesday go a bit crazy. They don't realize how close we came to a kind of massacre or hostage, hostage taking situation, how close we came to like a domestic terrorist attack on a successful domestic terrorist attack on members of Congress inside Congress. Yeah, I definitely I, I agree with you. And that's why I think it's so important that we do get the message out. And there are, you know, almost daily, we're learning new details every day. There's new videos coming out more horrific by the next you know, I, I saw that police officer getting dragged out of the Capitol and beat by an American flag. It's horrific, and everybody everybody needs to know what happened. And you know, you're already seeing some some far right, far extreme people saying that this was staged, that this was fake news, and this is kind of part of the part of the playbook now. And it's our job to really make sure that the public and that the world knows what happened. Yeah.
Um, and I have to ask, just before I let you go, you mentioned you're back there in Congress, you're on Capitol Hill. How does that feel? Uh, that must be a weird sensation to be back there in those corridors after seeing what you saw last Wednesday. You mentioned earlier you've been a congressional correspondent for a while, you're a politics reporter. Correct me if I'm wrong, you're not a former foreign correspondent or a war reporter. You've probably never been in a situation like that before, I'm guessing. No, I have not. Uh, you know, I, a lot of people have reached out to me saying that I should, you know, take some time and decompress. But walking around today has been uh, eerie. You know, there's still traces of uh, glass, broken glass bottles everywhere. Um, it's hard to believe we're just going to move on from this. I at least think that it's going to be a huge, horrific shame if we move on. There's got to be accountability. There's got to be accountability, in it, and I hope it happens. Indeed, there has to be there. It really does. Igor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate you taking time out. There is also the big question of what to do about the man who incited it all. Accountability, as Igor just put it. The man with the most to gain and who is now in danger of losing so much. A timetable is emerging for impeaching President Donald J. Trump a second time, say House Democrats, should he not resign in the wake of Wednesday's attack on the Capitol. Spoiler alert. He won't be resigning. House Democratic leader Steny Hoyer telling members that they should plan to return to Washington tomorrow to consider a resolution on the 25th Amendment. Voting on that would be tomorrow night at the earliest, and then the House would meet Wednesday morning to consider impeachment. House Democrats introduced a single article for incitement of insurrection when Trump supporters violently breached the Capitol. It says Trump, quote, gravely endangered the security of the United States and its institutions of government. He threatened the integrity of the democratic system, interfered with the peaceful transition of power, and imperiled a co-equal branch of government. He thereby betrayed his trust as president to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Last night, Speaker Pelosi gave chilling new details about Wednesday's attack. The staff went under the table, barricaded the door, turned out the lights, and were silent in the dark. Under the table under this the whole Under the table time. for two and a half hours. Wow. During which time they listened to the invaders banging on that door, as you can hear on a recording from one of the staffers' phones. So when this was happening, and when Speaker Pelosi's offices were being vandalized and defaced, the public servants who worked there were only one doorway and one tabletop away from discovery. What would have happened to them if the rioters had found them? Amazingly, some Republican senators are like Charlie Brown and the football and willing to believe Donald Trump has learned his lesson this time. No, really, they say, he has. What the president should do is now finish the last 10 days uh, of his presidency. So no. That the president touched the hot stove on Wednesday and is unlikely to touch it again. Uh, and if that's the case, I th we, we get every day we get closer to the last day of his presidency. We should be thinking more about the first day mm -hmm. of the next presidency than the last day of his presidency. Yet it hasn't even been one year since the last impeachment. Not one trip around the sun, and Senator Susan Collins said this. I believe that the president has learned from this case. What do you believe the president has learned? The president has been impeached. That's a pretty big lesson. I'm voting to acquit because I do not believe that the behavior alleged reaches the high bar in the Constitution for overturning an election and removing a duly elected president. I believe that he will be much more cautious in the future. Wow. That take aged well, didn't it? The only lesson Donald Trump has learned since then is that he could get away with anything even violence. And since his effort to steal the election didn't work before the election or on election day or in the courts or by strong-arming state election officials, the president kept trying. He spread demonstrably false misinformation that the election had been stolen to rile up his supporters. And then he incited them and pointed them in the direction of Congress on Wednesday morning. He became one of those foreign authoritarians he loves to praise, one of those foreign enemies of the United States, as AOC pointed out on Sunday. Perhaps my colleagues weren't in that room. Perhaps my colleagues were not fully present for the events on Wednesday. But half of we came close to half of the House nearly dying on Wednesday. And 
if a foreign head of state, if another head of state came in and ordered an attack on the United States Congress, would we say that that should not be prosecuted? Should we, would we say that there should be absolutely no response to that? No. It is an act of insurrection. For more on the perilous juncture we find ourselves in and what should happen next, let's turn now to someone who might be able to give us insight into all of this, Jason Stanley, a professor of philosophy at Yale and author of the book How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. Uh, Jason, thanks for coming back on the show. Senator Roy Blunt seems to think President Trump has learned his lesson. How often do you find authoritarian rulers redeem themselves? Uh, very rarely, if at all, and certainly not Mr. Trump who has told us again and again what his plans are to stay in office no matter what, uh, no matter what the election results, no matter what uh, other people allow him to do. He has pardoned numerous, uh, he has pardoned uh, people convicted of war crimes, as in Ryan Gallagher, clearly signaling to armed forces that those who step out of line and support him will have his support. He has appealed to law enforcement uh, he has tried to destroy the post office to to fix the election. He has and he has announced this repeatedly and clearly. He has announced his intentions to stay in in office no matter what for years on end. So the kind of delusion that Americans yeah. are undergoing is surprising. Some Republicans are saying, no, no, it's not the time for impeachment. They're cynically calling for civility and unity and healing. Uh, how do you do any of that under a shadow of? rising fascism and mob violence? Well, you, it, without accountability, you are signaling that uh, the behavior should continue and won't be punished. It's extremely clear. Uh, no justice, no peace is a famous uh, saying. Uh, peace without justice, <laughs> uh, that's going to be done uh, only if uh, you give these people, if these people uh, have their way. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is we're seeing people, highly educated senators, Senator Hawley, Senator Cruz, these are Stanford, Stanford, Yale Law grads, uh, Princeton graduates, Harvard graduates, uh, adopting the big lie, adopting uh, the an obvious fake, uh, an, something that they know is false, and they're completely joining this intentionally and knowingly. They have no excuse of ignorance, no excuse of being tricked, these are the elite of the elite. Senator Hawley is a banker's son who went to uh, to Stanford and then Yale Law. They have no excuse. And when that happens, you really have to worry. When people like that join this kind of movement, what they're doing is representing themselves as the lieutenants and perhaps even the generals of the future. So what is the danger then, Jason, if we don't act forcefully, if House Democrats, Senate Democrats don't act forcefully now in the wake of this attack, not just in terms of holding Trump to account, but holding the plotters in, in Congress, people like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and Rick Scott, holding them to account too. What does history teach us when we don't have accountability? What happens? When we don't have accountability, then we will create a new social movement going forward that will be based upon this big lie, like the stab in the back myth that motivated uh, the Nazi party in the 20s and the 30s. You don't have to make an analogy, tight analogy or identification of what's happening with the Nazis to see the structure. The idea is, you know, there's no legitimate government except for us. Uh, the truth doesn't matter uh, and there's no accountability. So we're not going to be punished. Uh, we're just going to keep on doing this. We already have many QAnon supporters as Congress people. Think about that. Uh, QAnon is essentially the protocols of the elders of Zion, blood libel. It is a Nazi uh, conspiracy theory, uh, which is which is growing and growing. And without a very strong response, I don't know what form that response should take. But to have there's no excuse for for senators like Hawley and Cruz to have joined this. Uh, we need a society-wide response or else democracy is an extraordinary peril. The Republicans have already signaled that they're willing to have power, to retain power as a minority party. But these additional figures are saying we don't even want the imp imprimatur of fair elections. That's not important to us. Um, we, we also have to look at law enforcement and, and what's going on with infiltration in um, oh, yeah. throughout Yeah, there's talk of, there's all sorts of reports coming out about police officer complicity, whether there were 
troops present in the crowds, a lot of question marks about that. Um, that is redolent of things throughout history where the, the disease of authoritarianism is spreading, uh, especially in, yes, law enforcement circles. When we talk about authoritarianism and fascism, some people, Jason, uh, including liberals and leftists, have spent the last few weeks, months, years, saying that when you and I... Uh, talk about fascism in the United States, we're being hysterical. It's hyperbole. Uh, five days after this attack on the seat of government and democracy in the United States, what is your response to them? My response is it's past time to deny the dangers here. Uh, there's a combination. Uh, yes, the status quo is problematic. Yes, uh, lack of accountability for the war on terror, for the torture regime. Uh, the status quo was bad, and that's what a lot of leftists are saying. But what we have now is we have a new social and political movement uh, given this election uh, and, and with Trumpism uh, that, uh, that is beyond uh, the, status, the, the badness of the ordinary status quo. We have, uh, we have, as black Americans have been telling us for many, many years, uh, we have white nationalists and people uh, clearly sympathetic to an authoritarian white nationalist or Christian nationalist president. Uh, black Americans have been telling us that law enforcement and all sorts of, uh, and ICE, uh, we know this, are shot through with supporters of a potential movement. Uh, it's time to, to see that, you know, there's no, there's no dichotomy between the status quo is problematic, and uh, which is what these people want to say, and that Trump is problematic. They're both problematic. They're intermingled. Uh, the failure to deal with the war on terror has left us with things like ICE, homeland security, militarized police, a disaffected population in the wake of failures of, of the elite. Uh, and that should make us more worried about fascism, not less worried about fascism. Now everything these people, the doubters have said, has come to pass. So we, we, see a coup, we see a coup attempt. We see all the elements that they've said weren't there in place. So it's time to focus on the problem. One last quick question to you. I would ask you this. Trump will be gone on January 20th, but the Republican Party will remain. The Republican Party of uh, plotters like Cruz and Hawley, of open inciters of violence like Louis Gohmert or Mo Brooks in the House. Uh, even people like Marco Rubio and Roy Blunt, who didn't vote to overturn the election, but spread the lie about election fraud. How would you describe the Republican Party right now politically? The Republican Party needs to deal with a neo-fascism problem. They've been flirting, they've been openly, they've been anti-democratic, but playing the democratic game for a long time. They've lost seven out of the last uh, presidential elections, the popular vote, and they've been fine with that. Uh, they've been engaging in voter disenfranchisement and gerrymandering. When you do that, you're inviting people who come and say, let's stop pretending. Let's just stop pretending. Let's be authentic. And they have to deal with that problem. Professor Jason Stanley, we'll have to leave it there. You were sadly ahead of the curve on all this. Thank you for joining me on the show tonight. When we come back, Trump and followers banned from Twitter and Facebook. Parler booted from the servers. The question is, where does the right go now? Kara Swisher joins me live next to talk about all of this. For the four years of his presidency, Donald J. Trump 
harnessed the power of social media to spread his messages practically unfettered. Messages that often included dangerous conspiracy theories, half-truths, and outright lies. And now, in his last full week as president, he finds himself without his favorite mode of communication, with the internet itself seemingly turning on him after last Wednesday's attack on the Capitol. Twitter has permanently suspended his account, and he's blocked indefinitely from Facebook. The payment processor Stripe cut ties with the Trump campaign, citing last week's violence. Then there's Parler, the alternative social network that has drawn conservatives and also far-right extremists. The site is now down after Apple, Google, and Amazon all suspended it over its failure to moderate violent content. Speaking to Fox Business this morning, the company's CEO, John Mates, denied the platform was used to incite the Capitol riot. No, there's no, there's no evidence that Parler has anything to do with inciting any of that. Uh, there's no mechanism to meet up or organize some kind of event like that on Parler. We never, never promoted that kind of violence or anything like that. We would have never condoned it. You know, we have a lot of things in place to stop it. But Amazon and and, Face and, uh, and Apple and uh, Google, they don't care. They're using this as an opportunity to squash the first real competitor in this space. In particular, some Republicans are calling the bans of Trump and others a violation of their First Amendment rights. It's not. But even people who are not supporters of the president can't help but ask how much power tech companies do or should have when it comes to deciding what is or isn't acceptable speech. Who better to talk about, uh, who better to talk to about all of this than someone who's been following the ups and downs of Silicon Valley for decades now, Cara Swisher, host of the podcast Sway and New York Times contributing opinion writer. Cara, so great to have you back on the show. On it. New Year's Eve, you made some predictions for 2021, including that Trump would be banned from Twitter, but not until he was out of office. In fact, you wrote, I have never thought, as many have, that Mr. Trump should have been deplatformed during his term as president. As flagitious as he can be, Mr. Trump has been a legitimate news figure, and thus what he had to say should be aired. Now that he right. has been banned while still in office, right. do you feel the same way? Well, no. I mean, I, I thought he would be banned. He didn't do something like this, which is cross the bright, bright, bright line in most of these uh, most of these social platforms, which is incitement of violence. I couldn't have been imagined that he would have continued to do this after after the election, and especially when these these uh, protests were taking place to push them into a violent state. And I think that's a very different thing. And these companies have been watching him really carefully, and they moved him off. I had gotten sense from them that they were get ready to move him off for the basic violations he had done over the whole course of his presidency, which they've been very slow to move on, if at all. They just have allowed him to continue to lie and put misinformation out. And that was an issue for a lot of people, but he is the president and he got special dispensation. As as it got worse, they put yes. labels on him and now, of course, this. And I think once he crossed that line, that incitement to hate line, you, it, it, incitement for violence, that really was the one they were able to finally get him on. Um, yes, and those labels, of course, you mentioned, I always found those labels ridiculous. ridiculous. By the way, uh, Jennifer Palmieri, former Hillary Clinton aide, uh, mm -hmm. she said, she made the point that she, she, they banned him or they got rid of him on the same day that basically the Democrats mm -hmm. officially took control of the Senate yes. and all the committees. Huh. Do you buy that correlation? Do you think that was in huh. their minds? It's an unusual coincidence, I would say. And, you know, Facebook has been in a bear hug with the Trump administration since the beginning, um, since Peter Thiel held that first meeting in Trump Tower with all the heads of uh, the tech companies. He brought that together. Yes. And so that's been a real close relationship uh, for them. And so I think they probably looked up and said, oh, no, we're exposed and we're about to be regulated uh, out the yin yang here. Um, and so we better get on a better course with the uh, with the Biden administration. Um, I don't think the Biden administration is going to be particularly aggressive, by the way, but you do have in maybe Kamala Harris and some others uh, a little bit more power to do something. And when you have a, a fully unified Congress and White House, they certainly could get a lot done. And there's some senators like Amy Klobuchar, uh, John Warner, a whole bunch that really do have some plans. And also Elizabeth Warren, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so. Yes. We'll see. And of course, Joe Biden told your paper's editorial board famously that he doesn't like Mark Zuckerberg. He's not a fan of Zuckerberg, <laughs> but let's wait and see what he does. Uh, Cara, yeah. some conservatives are trying to make Trump's Twitter ban a First Amendment issue. But of course, Twitter is a private yeah. company that can set its own terms and conditions, its own policies. But it does raise the question over the precedent it sets. What do you think it means for free speech in general that essentially two Silicon Valley billionaires, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, are deciding who says what, when, and where online. 
Well, no, they're citing what, when, and where on Facebook and Twitter. Now, that's the issue is they're quite big. Twitter is actually not that big, if you think about it comparatively. There's lots of other places to say things online. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the president in his house has an actual podium that goes through every media organization in the world instantly. So he does have an ability to talk to people. Yes. The idea he does, the course. reason he doesn't want to is because he gets pushback from reporters and what it ends up is in, in, you know, injecting disinfectant discussions. And so that's why he likes Twitter because it's unfettered for him to say what he wants and then get the reaction. And so any, he likes to be on any platform where he's unfettered and that's what he likes and that's what he doesn't get to do now. And that's a problem because there isn't an alternate forum. And even Facebook really wasn't his the place. They, they use that for advertising and to, to find find people and to raise money and things like that. Twitter was his megaphone and it was his megaphone where he could say and do anything he wanted. And he thought he could, you know, walk down, you know, digital Fifth Avenue and shoot anyone, but he can't actually. Yeah, that's a good, a good analogy there. Yeah. What, I, what I was trying to get at though, Cara, beyond just Trump, and I agree with you on, on, on that point about him having the podium in his house yeah. and nonsense that he silenced, is this idea that these two people, yes, yeah. they have these big platforms, Facebook is bigger than Twitter, but it, you know, they pretend to want to avoid politics, right? They say, this is nothing to do yes. with politics, this is our guidelines, we don't take a position on politi uh, you mm -hmm. know, politicians lying in ads, yeah. as Zuckerberg put it. But actually, a lot yeah. of people, a lot of people even before Trump, you had, pro you had Palestinian groups, for example, who've been complaining for a couple sure. of years now that their pages are being taken down on Facebook, they believe it's they're being politically targeted. And I just wonder, a lot of the liberals and leftists who cheered Trump's uh, ban, for good reason, as you point out, incitement to violence, you know, what mm -hmm. happens if in the future they're on the receiving end of decisions they don't like from Mark Zuckerberg and J Jack Dorsey? Well, that's an issue about power, and that's an issue about market concentration, and that's very different from a First Amendment issue. When you have Matt Getz and the others who are complaining about losing Twitter followers, by the way, read the room, Matt. You know, people have died at the Capitol, and it's been trash. Talking about your Twitter followers seems to be a yep. problem. Not, well, it's just stupid is what it is. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it is an issue. And the question is, is about market concentration of, uh, of, of people in power and, and the companies in power. And what we need is more companies, innovation, and legislators that will actually do legislation around privacy, around uh, innovation, around all kinds of things, and, and market power. And that's the real problem. Conservatives are always complaining about being discriminated against online. Well, guess what? It will be fixed if we don't have companies that are all powerful. And it's not, it's, again, they, they're making these arguments around the First Amendment when it's a business issue. It's an issue about being able to have new companies, uh, you know, rise up so that there's lots of choices for consumers. That always solves the, these yeah. situations and not not this ridiculous. It's not the First Amendment. And one of the things that drives me crazy is yeah. this narrative around the First Amendment is, 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 is this idea that a company should be told, a private company should be told what to do by the government. That is that is what they call socialism. And I think they're not socialists. They seem to not like socialists, but they're acting like what they describe socialists to be. And believe me, I don't think it's accurate either. Um, yes. So I think the issue no. is a bipartisan well, Mike, group of people. Mike Pompeo made that point, didn't he, Cara? Whatever, yeah, he's a well-known socialist. Mike Pompeo said, so, oh, this is like the Chinese Communist Party, even though they're the ones yeah, who tell no. people what to say in China. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Um, Mike Pompeo gets to say is whatever it? he wants Sorry. most of the time. But let me, let me just say, <laughs> you need to have a bipartisan group of people getting together with companies, with citizens, with advocacy groups, and coming up with great legislation that 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 sh that should be smart and pr promotes innovation and promotes as many companies as possible. This will solve the problem. Of course, we've never done that in this country because the easiest thing to do is yell and scream and stamp our feet. That's you know that's what we do. Yeah. And you're, you're so 100 percent right about the big tech power and concentration of power and dealing with that. The irony is one of the few Republicans who wanted to deal with that, uh, who has been vocal mm -hmm. on that, is Josh Hawley, who's now tainted himself forever as a well, supporter of insurrection. Um, but let me yeah. ask. But let me ask you this, that Trump, Trump is now banned and you have other groups saying, well, wait a minute, uh, which other world leaders should now be banned? You have pro-Israeli groups, for example, flagging Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei in his tweets. Do the heads mm -hmm. of Twitter and Facebook understand the Pandora's box they may have opened here? They could be dragged down into all sorts of geopolitical conflicts, couldn't they? Yes, you are. Yes, they are. And you know, what's interesting is Mark Zuckerberg once said, I don't want to become the arbiter of the truth. I don't know why you'd build a system that requires one. So maybe we should look at the system and maybe the system is the problem that they've built here, which is an unfettered platform that also requires yeah. some sort of uh, monitoring and content moderation. And so, you know, it, it, the system, the way they build it systemically with addiction, with hate speech, with misinformation, with disinformation is the problem, the way it's built. 
and it's yep. it's behaving the way it was built. 100%. And don't be surprised that it does that. So this is what it does. And then you throw humans in there, and there you go. And let me just say one thing: if you looked, if you listen carefully, and I spent a lot of time listening to the people who were on, uh, were, were talking, who were invading the Capitol, and listening to what they were saying. They are like, I was thinking, I was watching the Nexium documentary. They are, they need to be deprogrammed because they've been fed a, a, a steady diet of lies about a lot of things. And so they believe what they're saying. And that's, you know, I don't have sympathy for them because they're adults and they knew what they were doing. But but I have to say to watch them speak, it's, it is literally like watching cult members and they have to be deprogrammed because of this this terrible news diet they've been receiving. And, and, and the poor information diet is really one of, that these companies uh, foist on everybody is really one of the biggest problems. Yeah. One last quick question. I mentioned Parler is now pretty much blacked out. On the yeah. day of the insurrection, you spoke Sorry. with Parler CEO John Mates. Uh, here's a little bit yeah. of what he said about uh, posts that seem to incite violence uh, to you. Have a listen. But going into the Capitol building to do this, if it was organized on your site, what should happen on your site? Look, if, if it was illegally organized and against the law and what they were doing, they would have gotten it taken down. But I don't feel responsible for any of this, and neither should the platform, considering we're a neutral town square that just adheres to the law. Neutral yeah. town square? Uh, that's a yeah. cop-out, isn't it? Does he have any interest in regulating any kind of content? I know they took down Linwood's execute Mike Pence posts. Finally. But is that their limit? Finally. Finally. No, it took them a while. And his whole thing is it's a jury of five people. On a, on a digital system where millions of, of issues are flooding over the system in any one minute. The, the next thing I said is like, you are not a town square and you are not, there's no neutrality to be had here and lots of issues. I think, you know, that was an unfortunate interview for him because it, it, this is, it led to all that, that happened. And what I really thought was important is listening to him and let him lay it out. And the problem he had is it wasn't one some short, I don't mean to be rude, this is a very long interview, but most of them are short. You know, you do these short quotes and things like that. He spent an hour explaining the system to him, and then he's surprised that people understood what he was saying. And so one of the things he was doing today was like, that's not what I meant. And I'm like, there is an hour of you saying, and I gave you ample opportunity. So, yeah. you know, yes, there needs to be moderation in some form. There's no such thing as fully free speech, especially when it comes around to violence. Yep. And I think the American people, again, have been fed this idea that there is. And these are not public squares. They're private companies. In Parler's case, it's owned by, it's it, one of the investors is the Mercers, the famous Mercers. In Facebook's case, it's Mark Zuckerberg. It, it, look, these are owned by people. They're making money off of you. You have to question what's going off them and, and what kind of monitoring any of these sites are doing. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Kara Swisher, we appreciate you asking those questions and coming on here to answer mine. Thank you so much. Trump may not be able to complain on Twitter anymore, but his allies certainly can. Their latest gripe, their number of followers. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tweeted this image over the weekend, claiming that he and other top Republicans lost tens of thousands of followers while top Democrats gained them. This is how you create an echo chamber, Pompeo said. Former White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said she had lost over 50,000 followers. Florida Congressman Matt Gates griped that he was down to 856K and dropping. Now, after last week's insurrection, Twitter purged thousands of accounts linked to QAnon. So if these guys are losing thousands of followers, maybe that says something about who was following them to begin with. And maybe, just maybe, that's not something to draw attention to, I'm just saying. Meanwhile, as these Republicans complain about the thousands of followers they've lost online, thousands of Americans continue to die every day from COVID. What about them? The latest on the pandemic crisis in 60 seconds.
While much of the nation was watching the Capitol last week, 22,000 people across the US, parents, grandparents, kids, doctors, nurses, essential workers, died from COVID-19. It's grim, it's exhausting, and it brings our national death toll to a remarkable 375,000 people. In fact, three states scattered across the country, Arizona, California, and Rhode Island, have the highest rates of COVID-19 infections per capita in the world. Out west in California, hospitals have resorted to conserving oxygen as supplies have run dangerously low, even putting patients in gift shops and conference rooms as they run out of space and shutting the doors to ambulance traffic for 12 hours. Some people, including those in need of intensive oxygen supply, have had to wait 18 hours to get into the ICU. Meanwhile, in Delaware today, President-elect Joe Biden received his second dose of the vaccine. He assured Americans his COVID-19 medical team would hit ambitious vaccination targets after he takes office next week. Despite estimates that 20 million Americans would be vaccinated by the end of 2020, so far only about 9 million people have received a single dose. Biden's team is considering delaying the second dose for now in favor of getting the first dose to as many Americans as possible. And yet, super spreader events continue, even inside the Capitol on the day of the siege. Republican and Democratic lawmakers were crowded into secure rooms in which many Republicans refused to wear face masks. In fact, following last week's failed insurrection, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, a cancer survivor who is 75 years old, tested positive for COVID earlier today. Listen to Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton speaking to me last week on this very concern. Oh, yeah, there was a group of Republicans, I mean, you can predict which ones they were, uh, who refused to put masks on. And I watched as several of my Democratic colleagues politely walked up to them and offered masks, uh, politely asked them to put on the masks that some of them already had. They refused to do so. They laughed at my Democratic colleagues. So what I did is I went up and took out my phone and I started taking pictures of them. And suddenly they started getting upset and they started yelling at me. And one woman, this Mary Miller, a freshman from Illinois, who's a total Trump acolyte, came and started screaming in my face. But I will say it was effective because a couple of minutes later, she put on our damn mask. Whether it's Capitol Hill violence or the COVID-19 pandemic, Republican recklessness continues to risk all of our lives. When we come back, Trump's list of enablers include not just his family, his supporters and his party. The media has played a role too, refusing to call out the president for what he truly is. Racist, fascist, a whole lot more. Stay tuned. For the past few days, many of us in the media have been rightly slamming Republicans for their role in the insurrection last Wednesday and for enabling the worst excesses of Donald Trump. What we haven't really done is take a long, hard look at ourselves, our own role in enabling him over the years. Because what happened last week didn't come out of the blue. It wasn't without warning or precedent. 
It was clear from day one that a Trump presidency would be authoritarian, bigoted, serially dishonest, outside the bounds of any previous modern presidency. It was clear that we shouldn't normalize him, but we did. Year after year, we allowed him and his stooges to flood the zone with nonsense. We did cover each controversy, but then we moved on. We gave him a pass again and again, even when domestic terrorists carried out attacks in his name. We graded him on a curve. We asked him softballs. We kept hitting the reset button. Oh, it's a new day for Trump. It's a new tone. He's a new man. This is the day he became president. Trump's racism was on full display from the moment he came down that escalator in 2015 and called Mexican immigrants rapists. And yet, until very recently, media organizations bent over backwards to avoid saying the R word. Instead, we heard racially charged, racially tinged, racially divisive, racially insensitive. Why couldn't they have just said racist? How about the F word? How can you say fascism? People said to me when I called Trump a fascist on primetime cable just six months ago. Well, now after a fascist mob overran the seat of our government, now everyone's saying it, including people who worked for the president. Who could have known? Well, the sad reality is that a lot of black and brown voices in the media, those of us who have had to battle racism and white supremacy all our lives, we were calling out Trump long before others, long before the capital attack, and without much support from our peers. That's why diversity matters. The US media has been too white for too long. And I'm glad things are changing, including here at NBC. And I'd like to think I'm a product of that change. But A, there's a long way still to go. And B, this isn't a game. It isn't a box ticking exercise. It has real consequences. When you have white supremacy on the rise, you need journalists who are clear eyed about the threat that poses and are willing to call it out. What we shouldn't have had is a sanitizing of white supremacy and fascism. Remember the Nazi next door profile in the New York Times? The guy who likes watching Seinfeld. Remember the profile of the neo-Nazi with prom king good looks who was trying to make racism cool again? Look, don't get me wrong, media organizations, including papers like the New York Times and magazines like Mother Jones, did excellent, excellent investigative reporting during the Trump years, uncovering scandal after scandal. Reporters and photographers at the Capitol last week did risk their lives to bring us the news of that historic and horrific attack. But when it came to connecting the editorial dots, when it came to telling the truth to our readers and our viewers about the authoritarian and, yes, fascistic nature of this presidency, when it came to grappling with the racism and white nationalism motivating both this president and many of his supporters, when it came to telling the truth, not about abstract polarization, but the far-right extremism of one particular party, too many in the media bottled it. At some point, we have to own this. Donald Trump and his mob succeeded in getting this far because we, the media, failed. We failed you. Too many journalists and news organizations opted for, it's both sides, it's a new tone, it's just rhetoric, it's just a few fringe crazies for far too long. And so look, if you work in the media and only now is the moment you're truly shocked by Trump or by Trump's supporters, only now is the moment you think he's gone too far, you have to ask yourself, why? Why did you turn a blind eye to the threat for so long? Because our democracy is now at stake and what happens the next time a Trump-like figure comes close to high office in this country? Will we speak truth to power or will we echo the utterly and infamously cynical view expressed by then CBS News Chairman Les Moonves when asked in 2016 about the Trump phenomenon? It may not be good for America, he said, but it's damn good for CBS. That way lies the end of democracy. And it's up to us, the fourth estate, to have a reckoning and to do better, to do much better. Joining me now to talk about this is Karen Atiyah, Global Opinions Editor at the Washington Post. Uh, Karen, thanks so much for taking time out to come on the show. How much responsibility do you think the US media has to take for what happened last week? A lot. Uh... And Mehdi, you said it very, very, very well, right? Again, we are the fourth estate. Um, and as I said on, on Twitter, the US Capitol 
building, the breach of the U.S. Capitol building was shocking. But honestly, I think when it comes to to the media and to the mainstream media, the breach of Trumpism and the breach of, of you know, coddling white violence and white supremacy and white anger started long before this. It's with profiles of, of white supremacists as if they were some curiosities next door, as if it was a spectacle, as if it was something, like an, a, a subject matter for intellectual calisthenics, as if white supremacy and racism are ideas to be debated other than and not uh, mm -hmm. uh, movements to be defeated because I think what the media, what we are failing to understand is that it's not just about calling somebody a bad name, calling somebody racist. We are failing to understand that racism and white supremacy is a dangerous, violent uh, movement. It is a matter of life and death, and many of us saw when Trump called Mexicans rapists, we saw with the Muslim ban, we saw that he was willing to use violence in order to uh, uh, to ins ensure, you know, his supporters that this country was going to be for them. So I think this misunderstanding and, and underestimating how white violence in this country has shaped the country as we know it, our failures to grapple with it. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I, I so, feel emotional about it because it means if this house collapses under the weight of racism and white supremacy, as we're seeing right now, we all will pay the price. No, we will. And I appreciate your passion. And that's why I wanted you to come on the show tonight. And I'm glad you did. Uh, you did a fantastic Twitter thread on this very issue of media failures, especially from the perspective uh, of race and racism. You wrote, every glowing profile of the white supremacist next door, every attempt to both sides with people who hold racist, violent views was a breach into our democracy allowed by liberal media. And Karen, what I'm wondering is, why was it allowed, do you think? Because it is hard for a lot of our colleagues to grapple perhaps with the fact that sometimes when they see the images of, of Trump supporters or see, you know, these, they, they perhaps see people who remind them perhaps of, of family members, of friends and, and communities. And I think that, um, again, it serves the myth of American exceptionalism. It serves the myth of a so-called post-racial um, America. And it serves this myth that our institutions are strong enough to protect us against something that is in our DNA, that is in America's DNA, that is as uh, is in the oxygen that we breathe, right? And so I think it is very difficult for uh, many to understand that race and racism is a force that has shaped uh, our uh, not only you know our politics, not only our culture, our economy, but our very media. And there was a reason why we pushed so hard for diversity and for inclusion. Why we continue to do that because, as you said rightly, the fourth estate. We need to be strong. We need to be strong enough to be that line of defense for America. This house that Black people built, that Asian people built, that immigrants built. We need to be strong enough to protect this house. But if many of our colleagues can't even see that there's a threat, can't even see that there are people outside the door throwing Molotov cocktails of racism at this country, there's only so much black journalists, brown journalists. We are few. <laughs> we are not in power. Yeah. But I think we continue to do so again because it is our jobs. Our country depends on yeah. us clear-eyed. And I'm, you yes. know, I, we love to be right. We're all, we, our jobs are about being right. I would say this is a time where it gives me no pleasure to be right about no. what we were facing. Not at all. Not at I all. agree with you. hundred percent. Nobody wants to be vindicated on this. There's this weird paradox, Karen, isn't there, where the media 
both produced some of its best journalism in recent history during the Trump years, especially investigations of his finances, like the ones by your colleague David Farenthold at The Post, but also some of its worst journalism, the both sidesing of racism and white supremacy, the awful, awful interviews which top journalists did with the president up until Jonathan Swan of Axios showed them how to actually ask questions about his lies. It's like we saw the best and the worst in the same time period. <laughs> It's a confusing time, yeah, in, in many ways. And yes, there's been so much great journalism, um, and not just about the present, but just period. Um, but you know, I, I want to also go back to journalism and in the sense that, again, you and I are, are speaking. You know, I'm with the Post, with NBC, with very powerful uh, national platforms, and again, understanding that local media is also being stripped away by economic forces. So even if we wanted to understand more deeply what's happening at the local level, at the city level, at the community level, at the, you know, uh, PTO community board level, our resources to do that journalistically are being ebbed away, right, by, by economic forces. And many times, again, um, as we are talking about uh, uh, being able to see this country clearly, clearly uh, those, those uh, forces attacking you know, local journalism are things that I, I worry about. Um, and again, I think what our colleagues, what everyone needs to understand is when we're talking about diversity and the strength of media, it's not just about quotas, it's not just about jobs, it's not just about promotions. I think there are plenty of us who really, truly understand that this is about the soul of our country, that we want to be able to do our part to yeah. ensure that it's safe for, for everyone. Um, so again, I, I think the journalism will continue. I think, I you know, perhaps darkly, that this moment will spur, at least yeah. internally, reckonings about why we need to get this I hope right. So. I hope so. We will see. I hope so. We'll have to leave it there on a positive, hopeful note. Let's see. Washington Post Global Opinions Editor Karen Atiyah, thank you so much for your time and for your passion. Appreciate it. One last thing before I go tonight for all of you. Trump campaign spokesman Hogan Gidley, what campaign, was asked how President Trump is taking his recent ban from several social media platforms. And Gidley took it, well, he took it as an opportunity to say more mad stuff. With the social media crackdown, does he feel emasculated, especially as he heads out of office? Look, I, I wouldn't say emasculated. I mean, if, if the most masculine person I think to ever hold the White House is the president of the United States. Yes, macho, the man who skipped out on a celebration of the greatest generation of American soldiers who lost their lives in battle because he was afraid of getting his hair wet. Yes, macho, the man who is considering self-pardoning rather than take his chances in court. Yes, Macho, the man who berates reporters and walks away instead of answering any question he doesn't like. Hogan Gidley is confused playing the village people's macho ma at rallies with behavior that actually conveys true masculinity or principle of any kind. That does it for me tonight. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here live on Peacock. See you then.